Hello. It's about mid-afternoon for most of us here, perhaps the end of uh, another hectic week. Time for a break. So let's grab a cup of coffee or a cup of Joe, as our founder, Joseph T. Ryerson might call it, or your favorite afternoon beverage. And listen in as we have a little bit of coffee talk on what's moving the metals market. Hi, I'm Mike Carrazzo. I'm the content manager here at Ryerson, and I'm joined today by Nick Webb. He's our director of risk management and commodity hedging. How's it going, Mike? Good, Nick. How are you? I'm doing quite swell. Doing right. Great. Well, that's our goal here for Cup of Joe, and welcome to the very first episode. We're, we're glad you're a part of it. Um, the goal here at Cup of Joe is to have a candid and engaging discussion. There's some, there's some wild things going on in the market right now, and um, time to sit back and unpack it a little bit, but have an engaging conversation. And for those, uh, for those listening in, feel free to, enjoy it, to uh, join in on the conversation. You're going to see a Q&A button in the bottom of your screen. Send in a question, and we're going to save some time at the end here for, for a little bit of Q&A. Um, but as I, as I said, a um, lot going on from a macro and a micro perspective. Let's unpack it a little bit. So Nick, you're, uh, let us, uh, give us give us an overview of what we're about to talk about today. Excellent, yeah. And I know we've got some internal partners as well as external customers. So thank you to both, both parties for joining us for this. Uh, this is the first iteration, I would imagine over time, and we are going to do this on a monthly basis, but over time, I would imagine it's going to evolve. The content is obviously going to evolve um, because right now, we're in a very unique circumstance, and I think we've got a ton to talk about, not just across all three of the primary metals that we deal in, but also across the macro environment that we're, that we're dealing in. Um, so as we roll through time, there will likely be different things that pop up, but uh, for, for this one in particular, we're going, what we're going to do here in this, this presentation here today, we're going to talk about the macro environment, uh, some of the things that are going on within just what I'm deeming the shortage of everything. Um, really no matter which way you look it just seems like you, you can't get a lot of things uh, or they're extremely expensive to get to get those products whether it's metals whether it's other commodities um, whether it's certain you know industrial gases or lumber it, it's it's insane times right now um, so we're going to touch on that for a bit and then we're going to dive into each one of the metals and talk about the specifics that are going on that are driving some of the metals prices in different directions or to different degrees uh, to these unavailable circumstances so Let's go ahead and hop into it. First things first, and I def definitely don't want to uh, belittle this notion. Everything we're going to talk about here in this presentation has some element of a forward-looking idea. Uh, these are the thoughts and beliefs of Nick Webb. They are not the beliefs of Ryerson. Uh, take them as such. Do not trade on this information. Um, you know, do your own research. But really what these are, we want them to be useful. We want this data to be helpful. Uh, these are actual charts. These are actual data points that we're watching internal within Ryerson to try and make decisions. It's not all the information that we're watching, but it's definitely some of it. And, uh, and what you take away from it may be very different than what we take away from it. Um, but we at least want to present, present it to you, get the conversation going. And then uh, hopefully if, if we're able to have takeaways subsequent to these, these presentations on a monthly basis, you know, you're able to have a better sales dialogue with, you, with your Ryerson employee or uh, we're able to set up separate conversations with myself so that we can we can dive into some of these topics in a little bit deeper detail. But like I said, we'll start out on the macro side, we'll dive into each one of the individual metals, and then we'll finish off with a little Q&A. And uh, hopefully along the way, we'll have a little a little uh, coffee or, or beverage of choice, as Mike had, had, had noted. Um, so starting off on the macro side, again, shortage of everything. This particular chart is the industrial metals uh, Bloomberg chart. So this is going to be a basket of currencies, or a basket of uh, commodities across copper, aluminum, zinc, lead, steel, um, nickel. And you can see that despite the fact that we went through one of the most horrific things that, that the United States has ever had to deal with, and, and really the globe in general, and obviously prices suffered back in March, April, May of last year, we've come out of it to such a degree that we're now at multi-year highs. In some instances, in some commodities, uh, particularly carbon steel, we're actually at record high prices. And, and we're not just barely at record high prices. We are 30% above the previous high, which would have been back in 2007, 2008. And it's not just within metals. You know, like I mentioned this at the very onset, you look at lumber prices, it now costs an extra $25,000 to build a standard, you know, 2,000 square foot house. Uh, we're seeing shortages of semiconductors that are wreaking havoc on the auto industry. Um, we're seeing argon gas shortages. We're seeing freight rates, which we'll talk about here on this slide, which 
freight rates are going to the moon, whether you're talking about freight rates for uh, shipping cargoes coming from what this chart is showing, the, uh, the white line, which is the rate to get from Shanghai to the west coast of the United States, you can see that just over the last year, we've seen a, a quadrupling of, of that rate. So it's getting very expensive, very difficult. Uh, accessing containers just to ship product around the world is getting very expensive and difficult to find. And then domestically, we're showing the blue line here, which is domestic uh, flatbed freight rates. And you can see similar story there. We're at multi-year highs. And, and we're hearing some anecdotes from some longtime veterans within the industry who are saying these are some of the worst conditions they've seen for the flatbed market ever. And I don't think that that, that sentiment is really alone to just the flat roll market. I think if you talk to carbon participants, I think if you talk to other logistical you know, freight forwarders, people like that, in nearly every instance, this is the most peculiar and most difficult day-to-day -day, you know, timeframe that we've ever had to deal with. And Unfortunately, what it's doing is it's wreaking havoc on Ryerson supply chains and it's wreaking havoc on our customer supply chains. We understand that we're, we're in the same boat with all of this, but it's certainly causing difficulty of availability and it's causing rapid increases in prices. Now, Nick, Nick I'm glad you started with this chart here, right? Because if you look at, so what you're saying is it's costing more for the material to come into the country and then go about the country, right? And, and I mean, that's, that's when we talk about higher prices, it's not just a cost of material. I mean, a big, big part of that is the transportation, right? So, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty eye-opening right here. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, my world generally uh, typically re revolves around looking at commodity prices and, and markets in general. Um, it's evolving into a story whereby prices aside, it's almost, it's almost such that the priority is now just where can I get that, that next incremental pound or ton of metal? Um, I think that's the growing concern, both for Ryerson as well as for our customers, where price is almost agnostic at this point. It's just, where can I get that next incremental volume so that I can continue my production lines? Um, kind of timely, about 15 minutes ago, I don't know if you can see it over my shoulder, I've got CNBC online or on my TV, and Jay Powell, the head of, head of the Fed, was on, and he was being grilled, basically getting the question of, how, how can you say that we don't have rampant inflation right now? And, and it's interesting because he's kind of backtracking what he has been saying for the last two or three months, which is we aren't yet seeing persistent inflation. He's now kind of honing his message a little bit to say, well, it looks like we're seeing inflation, but we believe it's going to be transient, which means, or transitory, which, which means it's going to be temporary. That's, that's his commentary. That's not my own. And, uh, and I don't know whether this is going to be a temporary thing. We'll talk about, you know, some of the things that may cause it to be temp temporary. Um, but nonetheless, we're not talking about two, 3% moves in the price of a lot of these goods. We're talking about 30, 40, 50, in some cases, 200, 300% moves in the underlying cost of things. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what Jay is watching if he thinks there's no inflation because Unless you're looking at crude oil, natural gas, which are probably the only only exceptions I can think of, anything you're out there trying to buy right now, it, it's higher in price than it was last year, two years ago, three years ago. It, it's a it's a very interesting environment, and it's and it's really all in the face of what I would say is somewhat tepid demand. I mean, obviously we've had improving demand conditions, and that's shown here in this chart. Uh, this is an eye chart. There's a lot of data going on. But ultimately, what I really want you to focus on is going left to right. It's April of 2020 to, to March of 2021. On the left-hand side, you've got the pandemic. You've got the lockdowns. That is the most abysmal PMI data that we've seen in the history of this, these data points. As you can see, going left to right, China kind of started the, the launch back into normalcy. As you can see that their data was the first one to really turn yellow and then head, head back into the green territory. Uh, they're the one four down here in this list. But here we are, here we sit today in February, March um, with, with manufacturing PMI data. And again, PMI is the Purchasing Managers Index. So it's an actual survey that goes out to purchasing managers to determine are conditions better? Are they the same? Or are they worse than where we were a month ago, a quarter ago, a year ago? And as we sit here today, manufacturing conditions have, have improved. They've improved drastically. There's no doubt about it. But when you look at where we sit today from a demand standpoint relative to 2019, I think most data points, there might be specific industries that are doing way better. Um, but I think 
across the board, I'd still argue we're about flat to maybe even slightly down about 5%. So demand is, has improved, but demand isn't gangbusters. Um, so is that is that the formula for where we would see demand relative to record high steel prices? Maybe, maybe not, but we'll talk about some of those factors here in a few slides. Hey, um, just kind of looking at the colors here, like you mentioned, China kind of you know, from the yellow in April, May last year, and then spiked to the green. I can't help but notice that they're they're kind of in the yellow here in February, March. Is is that if they're kind of a leading indicator? Is that could yeah? That it's a great point, thanks, Mike. And and there are a couple of things to really point out. One is is China, obviously, which it's not it's not it's not enough to raise the red flag and and get my nickname back, Doctor Doom. But it's certainly something to be be cognizant of, and I think we have to be cognizant of it because. China represents 50 to 60% of global commodities consumption and production. And where China goes, so too goes the rest of the world at some point in time. It may not be immediate, but certainly China is a driver of commodities markets and commodity demand environments. And for them to, to be showing you know, those yellow signals, which it's still, it's still suggestive of growth, it's above 50, um, but it does look like it could be cooling. And uh, and as, as I mentioned, they were the ones that kind of led us out of the lockdowns and, and the, the horrific scenario back in April, May, June. Is this an early indicator that they may be slowing down a little bit? It could be. It could be. It's definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, the other thing that's worth pointing out is for any of our customers or any of our salespeople who operate down in Mexico within North America, for whatever reason, Mexico's had... You know, they've, they've had a terrible time coming out of this situation. You know, they're, they're flashing red, red signals, which is, um, you know, basically suggestive of a decreasing manufacturing growth. And uh, so that's, that's one to keep an eye on as well, because that, that's a pretty ugly scenario that they haven't reemerged the way that really the rest of the world has. We hope that once they're able to get vaccines in a large quantity down there, that that can start to turn the corner. But, but that's also one to keep an eye on. But we talked about China. And I certainly don't want to, uh, to skip over this. Over the last 30 to 45 days, um, China has started to be a, a little more vocal about the fact that they want to rein in credit conditions. And what I mean by that is they've been fueling their money, much like the European central banks and the Japanese central banks and, and the Federal Reserve. We've been flooding markets with a lot of accommodative policies over the last 12 to 15 months. And, and, and a lot of it's been for good reason. You know, we've, we've forced companies to lock down. We you know, in fairness, it probably makes sense to to fuel the market and jumpstart it so that we can get back onto normal course again. And, and China is no exception. They've certainly been very accommodative to their market over the last 12 months. But in the last 30 to 45 days, they've made some headlines by kind of suggesting that they are trying to rein in risk. They're seeing some speculation. That they're seeing overheating, uh, both within their their stock markets and their their financial markets, but also within their property sector. And when we look at this chart over on the left-hand side, which this chart is called the Chinese credit impulse chart. And all that really means is a fancy way of saying how accommodative or how tight is China approaching their financial system. And, and you can see that it almost goes in cycles. Every few years, they flood a bunch of new money into their system. And then when it, when it starts to overheat, they panic, they then pull that money out and they try and cool everything down. And it, it comes in waves. And, uh, and, you know, I don't know exactly how this is going to play out. We'll, we'll definitely see here, you know, in the coming months on this data, but it, it doesn't really take too much of a, of a mathematician to see that it looks like this mountain peak is looking awfully similar to the ones prior. We don't know that for sure, but it looks awfully similar. And it does corroborate with a lot of the, the written data and the verbal data that's coming out of the PBOC, which is they're trying to cool things down. So, why is that important? Again, China makes up 50 to 60% of the world's demand and production of commodities. And if China's trying to rein in speculation and property growth and you know, electric grid manufacturing, things like that, it will obviously, it would have an impact on commodity demand. It won't be immediate. Most analysts that I read about uh, from, our, from the banks that, that send us data, they kind of suggest about a six to nine month lead time on where this credit impulse chart goes, so too goes commodity markets. That doesn't mean it's gonna happen. That's, that's ultimately what analysts have suggested in the past. If that were to play out, you could be looking at maybe a Q4, Q1 2022 type situation where things cool off a bit. We don't know that for sure, but it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on. Another thing, thing we're keeping an eye on 
uh, as a potential inflection point for these these hot markets because that's what they are. They're they're hot and they're tight. It's hard to get metal. Um, is the U.S. dollar? The, we we look at the DXY index, which is looking at the U.S. dollar relative to a basket of currencies. In this case, um, the DXY has seen about a 13 percent depletion from basically March or April of last year to the end of 2020. And why would that happen? Well, back in March or April, uh, we saw what's called a flight to quality, which means when things get really scary and people don't know what to do with their money, they tend to flood their money into less risky assets, things like the US dollar, things like gold, things like treasuries, places where you can have safe haven assets. We saw that back in March, and you can see there was a big spike in the dollar as, as people moved out of equities and into things like the US dollar or gold. Since then, however, the Federal Reserve has, has flooded the economy with trillions and trillions of dollars. We talked about this a couple months ago on the Engage presentation, um, and it's certainly been the case throughout 2020. We are seeing a little bit of stabilization and even, even a little bit of an uptick. Now, I, I don't know if this uptick is going to continue the way we saw back in 2017, 2018, um, where it lasted for several years. That strength did. If that were to happen, generally speaking, there is an inverse correlation between the DXY and where commodities go. So what that would ultimately mean is all things being equal, if we see a stronger and stronger dollar, that would act as a headwind to the price of commodities. Again, we may be in such unique circumstances right now where the dollar is gonna play less of a role just because we can't get metal from the US, we can't get from foreign sources. The dollar may have less of an impact right now, but if supply demand fundamentals start to normalize, we have more normal conditions, you can bet that the dollar will eventually play, play a role again within base metals and, and ferrous metals alike. So with that being said, let's first hop into the, uh, the carbon world where there's, there's literally no shortage of things to talk about. Um, I already talked about the fact that we're at record high prices. This is just a one-year chart. And you can see that whether you're looking at US prices, which is the white line, uh, the blue line, which is gonna be Chinese prices, or European prices, they've all rebounded. They've all recovered. They're all generally correlated. It's just the extent to which US prices have moved higher has way outpaced foreign, foreign prices. Um, the spread between US prices and Chinese prices now is almost $600, which that $600 spread is literally higher than where steel prices themselves were just six months ago. And we're now at that big of a spread relative to the foreign market. So how does that happen? Well, I think this chart does a, does a pretty good job of explaining partially on, on how we got to where we are, which is back in March, April, May, the steel mills, give them credit, when they saw demand falling off a cliff and the US and Europe and China were all shutting down, US mills were very quick and very proactive to bring capacity offline. Um, this is the capacity utilization index and those numbers are on, over on the far right hand side represent the percentage of nameplate capacity that's actually operating. And you can see that production was brought down to about 50%. And that, and that was the right move um, because demand was brought to a standstill. Where I think the issue was, was fast forward to April, May, June, July, you had a situation where companies like ourselves, I'm not saying ourselves in particular, but everybody in, in the manufacturing industry was just fighting to survive. Um, I think a lot of end users were fighting to survive. They didn't know how long these, lo these lockdowns were going to last. So it was really a game of clean up inventories, you know, feed yourself hand to mouth with inventory as you need it. And there was no reason to really jump the gun and buy more than you needed because prices were low, lead times were short. And then we fast forward into September, October, we get, we get essential manufacturing back, um, start to get some good news around the vaccines, things start to reopen a bit. And I think it was really a function of demand started to pick up and it caught supply off guard. And you can see that supply has done a very valiant job of trying to catch up. And, and this is no doubt a V-shaped recovery and capacity utilization, but it just hasn't been steep enough. And it may not look like a lot, but if we were wound two, three months ago, the trajectory of this chart suggested to me that by February, we would have seen utilization back up above 80%. Well, here we are in April and we're still not above 80%. And the concern that I have for the, for the steel industry is that chart is kind of slightly starting to roll over a little bit, which is kind of saying that the steel mills may not be actively trying to get that percentage back up above 80. 
whatever the reason, whether it's purposeful, whether it's accidental, whether it's due to shutdowns or cyber attacks or union uh, strikes, utilization has started to slow down its trajectory of improvements. And, uh, and that's all in the face of, a, of an increasingly improving demand environment. So at, the gap may not be massive between where demand has recovered to and where supply has recovered to, but I think we're learning very, very quickly those very tiny sensitivities between mismatches between demand and supply or any kind of inefficiencies in the supply chain can cause massive gyrations, at least in the short term, in price. And I, I think that's really what we're seeing. I mean, not, not to bring too much levity to this situation, but it's, it's why you can have a situation like a GameStop go from $5 a share to $400 a share when their fundamentals aren't any good. Um, Short squeezes are real. They are. They happen. You can make a lot of money in them. And, and steel mills, no doubt, are making a ton of money right now for those who are able to produce and who, those, for those who are um, producing at high levels. They're making a ton of money. But at some point, short squeezes tend to end. Now, three months ago, four months ago, I, I'll readily admit I underestimated how long this would last and how far up we'd shoot because here we are today. We're three hundred dollars above record record prices back in 07. and uh, and right now there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of urgency to to get that back down. Um, you're not seeing a whole lot of steel mills scrambling to bring new capacity online. Instead, you're seeing new mills or you're seeing existing mills taking capacity offline for for maintenance. So it's I, I think this is with us for another couple months at least. Um, again, that's that's personal opinion. That is not a Ryerson opinion. But what's interesting is, and we could spend. Hey, Nick, I'm sorry. Before you move yeah. on, I got to ask one question about that. So that was chart. Can you mind going back a second? Fine. Right, so, so, yeah, can't move on from this one. So I'm looking at this and looking as far back as 2016. It never quite gets above 85. And, and I keep thinking in my mind, you know, we've got this little thing called the infrastructure bill that <laughs> might or might get passed later, right? And that, that might turn out a lot of, a lot of capacity. Do you, what is, could that create another scenario, right? If we're not back at these 85 or even more percent, I mean, could we be caught in another scenario? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to be too perverse about the whole situation, but yeah, it, it's, it's an amazing situation where, we're, you know, as we sit here today, we're talking about not knowing where we're going to get that, ex, that next incremental ton. And we don't know whether we're going, where we're going to get it domestically. We don't know where we're going to get it from foreign sources. Um, it's not to say that they're not there, but but in large quantities, it's hard to come by steel right now. It's hard to come by aluminum. It's hard to come by stainless. But yeah, you, you sprinkle in the fact that now we're talking about adding to incremental demand. I don't know where that's going to, where that capacity is going to come from in the immediate term. Now, we, we've got a couple of things we'll talk about here in a few slides where I think we'll, we'll normalize or we could normalize. But, but yeah, there, we're in a weird predicament where, you know, the current demand conditions as they exist today, pre-infrastructure bill can't even can't even get metal, and and we're at record high prices. So yeah, no, it, it could it could definitely create a real a real issue. Um, and I, I'm I'm sure at some point we'll probably get questions about buy American or, or things like that. I mean, at some point you can't buy American because there's not enough capacity to meet domestic demand. Um, it's worth noting. I mean. The United States is, is typically in a normal environment, we're net short steel. We, you know, even if we were operating 100% capacity, uh, the United States is still a net exporter or sorry, importer of steel. We, we net import roughly 20 to 30 million tons of steel on an annual basis. So by all means, we're still going to import steel even if and when domestic capacity improves. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's, a real, that's a real head scratcher on where, where that capacity comes from. The good news on that, the good news on, on your question is the infrastructure bill is going to extend over eight to 10 years. Um, right. The supply situation in the United States may look totally, totally different in two to three, four years um, to, to catch up with those sorts of demand forecasts. Because we all know metal is going to matter to that, to for sure, seeing those numbers and how much steel you're going to need per billion of investment in the infrastructure. So that's good to hear. Great. No doubt. Yeah, C CRU estimates that the incremental demand for, for metal consumption is roughly three to 5% per year. So it's, it's meaningful, it definitely is. Um, but as I was saying, we, we could probably spend a half an hour on this chart alone. Um, there's a lot going on, there's a lot to take in, but 
what we're ultimately looking at is the steel futures curve from six months ago in the blue line down in that far bottom left corner. Uh, we've got it from a month ago, which is the green line. And then we've got the current futures curve, which is the orange line. A couple things to note. The futures market represents the price to buy and sell steel or, or any, any commodity in the future. Um, if somebody doesn't like the price or they think it's too low or they think it's too high, uh, anybody who has a futures account or a trading account can go out and buy or sell these products. In addition, shameless plug, Ryerson also offers hedging solutions using these, these exact markets and these exact prices so that we can offer through fixed prices to our customers. It's definitely something that we pride ourselves on. So if any of our customers ever want price stability, we, we can give it but we're subject to these futures markets. So let's dive into this chart real quick. Six months ago, the futures market, which is for all intents and purposes, uh, the futures market represents a forecast. It, it represents what the market at that point in time thinks prices are going to be in the future. Because if it didn't represent that, somebody would come in and they'd buy the futures contracts and they'd drive the price higher. Well, six months ago, the market didn't think that prices were going above $650. I didn't either. I mean, we were in a scenario where demand was improving, but demand wasn't going gangbusters. Uh, supply was improving, but supply wasn't going gangbusters either, unfortunately. Um, we got into a situation where I think demand came online just at a slightly faster clip than what supply was. And this is the situation we wound up with, which is the front end of the futures curve and, and spot prices in general spiked to record highs. And, and like I said, it's gone far longer and far faster and far higher than I think any, any analyst or any trader could have ever imagined. But here we are today. So what's the market saying today? Well, the steel futures market is effectively saying things are going to stay up around these prices for the next couple of months in excess of three, about $1,300 a short ton. But looking out into the summer and looking out into Q4 and looking out into next year, the futures market right now is saying, look out. Now, Couple caveats, the futures market is often wrong. It is a snapshot at any point in time. So it can absolutely be wrong. We can stay up here longer than, than people can, can predict. Um, but nonetheless, that is what we're seeing in the current futures market. So why, why is there such a prediction for a three to 400, maybe even $500 move down over the next six to nine months? Well, a couple factors. One is what goes up must come down. Steel is a cyclical, cyclical industry. We've seen it in prior cycles. When prices tend to, to jump 30, 40, 50, 100%, on the backside of that tends to be supply ends up meeting demand, clear heads prevail, fundamentals prevail, and prices start to, to come back down. That's one function. There is a function of at some point in time, and it, it depends on which steel mill it is, at some point over the summer, uh, steel dynamics and turnium are expected to bring online about 7 million tons of steel. So that represents almost 10% of US domestic supply. That's new supply that's gonna come online in the summer. That may, that may potentially weigh on prices. It would, it would make sense that it, that it would, just adding new supply into a market, unless demand improves drastically, which it could. In addition to that, sometime in late 2021, we're expected to see Nucor and ArcelorMittal add another 4 million tons of steel. So there are analysts out there, and, and I, I won't name names because I don't want to throw them under the bus, but they have been calling for steel Mageddon and, and an absolute collapse in prices. And, and they're still calling for it. And I've I, in the history of my career, which isn't all that long, but in the history of my career, I've never seen a larger divergence of opinions in the steel market than, than we're seeing today, because there are analysts out there who think that prices by, by year end may be as low as $600. Um, there are other analysts who think that this thing's got some legs, and if we continue to see demand tick back up, we're going to see prices in excess of $1,200, $1,300 for a much longer period of time. That's why we play the game. That's why, that's why this is very interesting for me. It's, it's, why, it's why I love analyzing the markets and talking to customers about markets because there's a lot to talk about and unpack here. Um, but as we sit here today, there is an expectation that prices are going to normalize. Uh, supply is eventually going to catch up. But keep in mind, you know, demand conditions are continuing to improve. People are continuing to get vaccinated. 
and uh, and end market conditions are continuing to improve. So it's going to be an interesting one to see how 2021 plays out. Um, Nick, so question, if I'm reading that right, right, if we would have purchased that or if that the you're looking at the bottom, the blue line, right, that's that. Well, it's under six hundred dollars. Right. I mean, and, and when you're looking at what the orange line represents, that's mostly based on anticipation that this production is going to come back online. Correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I hate to give for those who didn't hedge, you know, it's obviously salt in the wounds. Um, but I, I will note, I mean, just as a quick commercial for any customers we've done hedges for, whether it's in steel, whether it's in aluminum or, or, or even nickel, if we did hedges for them over the last 12 months, they couldn't be happier. Um, so, so taking out price volatility, it, it's great when you take out the volatility. It's even more fun when you take out the volatility and the market goes way, way higher and you get to continue to buy at lower, lower prices. Um, you know, I, we, we've saved customers large quantities of money to their, to their cost of goods sold by, by doing hedges for them. So it is worth noting, you know, as we look at the steel futures market right now, if we look at 2022, for example, first half 2022, right now the price might be right around $900 per short ton for hot roll. Is $900 a good number? Well, it depends on who you ask. It depends on your perspective. If you compare it to the current spot number, yeah, it's a great number. It's $400, $450 below where the current spot number is. That's a great number. Um, if you compare it to where the historical average is, which is probably closer to 600 to 630, it's not a great number. But if you can predict what the world's gonna look like nine months from now, then you should definitely open up a futures account and start trading this stuff. But if you're trying to manage your cost of goods sold and you're trying to manage to a budget, utilizing these markets and keeping a close eye on these markets is, is certainly gonna be of you, I think. Playing the same game within the, the carbon scrap world, this is the same set of charts, six months ago, one month ago, and today for bushling scrap. Um, again, it's very similar scenario, but it's worth noting a couple things. I mentioned the fact that uh, Ternium, Steel Dynamics, Nucor, and ArcelorMittal are all bringing on additional supply. Much of this supply, both within the United States, Mexico, and really worldwide, is being driven towards electric arc furnaces. So what does that mean? Well, a lot of these green energy pushes are taking steel production away from iron ore-based production and pushing it towards scrap-based production. Because recycling and turning metal from scrap into a finished product, whether it's aluminum, stainless, or carbon, is definitely a more green way to approach an industry. We're obviously seeing a big green energy push, both domestically as well as within Europe and Asia. And, uh, and I think that is, it, it's had an impact already uh, on scrap markets, but I think it's gonna to continue to have, have an impact to the positive impact on scrap itself. And, and what that may do, and I don't know this for sure, but it may in fact lift the floor of how low carbon scrap prices can go because there's so much more of both North American production as well as global production that is shifting continually towards EAF. So what does that mean? It means demand for scrap is gonna go up. So what does that mean for steel? It could very well mean that the, the bottom with how far steel prices may drop could be more finite than what we've seen in past cycles. Don't know that for sure, but that's certainly a potential theme that could play out. And we're seeing that within futures markets. Switching over to the aluminum market. Um, I've only got a, a couple slides on both the aluminum side and on the stainless side. And that's just because the commodity element of aluminum and stainless are a little more calm. I don't wanna belittle the point that both aluminum and stainless are going through the same supply chain difficulties and availability is incredibly difficult. In some ways, I would actually make the argument that potentially aluminum and stainless, the finished product, the finished coils, may actually have longer legs to these supply chain issues than even steel. Um, so I don't, I don't wanna blossom or the fact that just because I have two charts on each of these, that it's not a big deal. We're seeing very similar circumstances, maybe even worse circumstances within aluminum and stainless. But we'll talk about the commodity side uh, here, here in one sec. But here on this side, here on this chart, we've got the LME price, which is gonna be the white line. And we've got the blue line, which is gonna be the Shanghai aluminum ingot price. And you can see that this is a five-year chart. Generally over time, they correlate very tightly to one another. And it makes sense because they are the same product. They're aluminum ingot. They're just traded on two different exchanges, one in China, one in London. 
Um, most of the product that we buy domestically is going to be based off of the London Metal Exchange price. If we buy product or import product from China, we'd, we'd likely be more subjected to the Shanghai futures market. What you'll notice is, is in recent months, there has been a divergence or a gap or what I would call in the trading world an arbitrage that exists between the Shanghai market and the London Metal Exchange market. And that gap is real and, and traders can take advantage of that. And, and the way they take advantage of that is they go out and they buy metal off the LME, they put it on a boat and they ship it to China and they, they deliver it at the Chinese price. And they'll, they'll capitalize on the profit that, that represents that spread between the two markets. Um, so as I look at this chart, there, there probably is reason to believe that we should see some sort of convergence between the LME price and the Shanghai price, because there is a real profitable exercise that can be done to close that gap. Um, we don't know whether that's going to be a function of LME rising, Shanghai coming down, or a combination of the two, but it, but it looks like there needs to be some sort of compression between this spread. Uh, while we're on this slide, I will, I will put on my Dr. Doom hat for just one second. Um, no, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> we are starting to see Harkening back to 2017, 2018, um, some history is starting to rhyme a little bit. And what I mean by that is very, very recently, and when I say recently, in the last 24 to 48 hours, starting to see some headlines about Russia playing some games with Ukraine and potential sanctions being placed on Russia. And if, if those on the call recall, uh, back in 2017, the United States put sanctions on a number of Russian individuals, Oleg Deripaska, who was uh, a, a large owner of Rusal, which is one of the largest aluminum producers in the world. When that happened, you can see you can see it pretty clearly about midway into that chart, call it Q1 of 2018, almost overnight, the price of LME had the biggest increase it's ever had in the history of the London Metal Exchange. And this is a 100-year-old market. I'm not saying that there's a high likelihood of this, but I am saying that there are rumblings of uh, the United States potentially placing sanctions on Russian individuals or Russian entities. Uh, I haven't heard anything that suggests that they would do it against Rusal again, um, but I definitely, as a risk manager, I at least want to have that in the back of my mind, and I at least want to plant the seed that it might be a couple percent chance that we could see additional sanctions on Russia because of their dealings with Ukraine right now. Um, that's certainly not a base case, but it's something that I, I at least want to make sure that viewers and listeners are, are cognizant of. Because if that were to happen, it, it could almost overnight cause prices to, to spike. Because is that is that your spot in the chart there around 2019 where it starts to come down, right, where they were lifted? That would have been when they were lifted. That's okay, correct. so that, then if we could see that, right, they, they rose there in 2017. You saw the, the, the drop there. So you're saying there, if that happens again it's not out of the question to see a. Yeah, and, and, and you raise a good point. Taking my Dr. Doom hat off, um, the blips to the upside when you put those sanctions in place, they can be meaningful, they can be quick, and they'd be to the upside. But I, I mean, as you point out, they can go the opposite way too as soon as they're lifted. So it, it can get volatile though. Um, and and that's, that's ultimately where, you know, we like, to, we like to promote risk management, we like to promote stable pricing, we like to take volatility out of supply chains. Um, so yeah, another quick commercial, but nonetheless, that, that is something that, that is starting to raise some eyebrows as we sit here today. Um, but looking specifically at ingot prices, this again is, is looking at the futures markets six months ago, one month ago, and today. And again, six months ago, the futures market totally missed it. The, the, the futures market was saying that Midwest premiums were going to be stable. They were going to be around 12 cents a pound. Fast forward to a month ago, they jumped up to about 17 cents. Fast forward again to where we are today, we're now above 20 cents a pound on the spot Midwest premium. Um, so why does that happen? It's difficult for mills right now and re-rollers to get P1020 aluminum ingot into the Midwestern portion of the United States. And, and this is a reflection of that. We're seeing that not just in a reflection of Midwest premiums, we're also seeing that reflected in the price of conversions. We're also seeing it in just the fact that lead times are getting extended within aluminum. So, you know, again, I've only got two charts on the aluminum side, but, but make no mistake, even though we're not seeing massive volatility within the LME price, we are certainly seeing extended lead times for 
you know, every indicator that we're hearing is suggesting that markets are going to remain tight for probably the better part of 2021 as we're seeing it right now. So, you know, do your, do your best to work with our supply chain teams and our sales teams to make sure that you've got your forecasts uh, communicated well and that you've got your volumes allocated for you because that, that's arguably going to be more important or at least as important as, uh, you know, managing the price risk. And then lastly, a little bit of fresh air, again, on the stainless steel side, make no mistake about it, stainless steel lead times are long, both within North America as well as Europe. Um, you know, we're, we're talking late summer, maybe even into early Q4 already for, for domestic lead times for both North America and for Europe. So stainless is a different, stainless is an interesting animal because at least in my personal opinion, we're seeing a little bit of a divergence between what's going on within finished stainless, which looks really, really strong, really tight. It's hard to find common alloy or you know common grades of, of stainless. So again, making sure that you've got your, your volumes committed already is very important. But what we are seeing is a bit of a divergence in the underlying commodities that make up the surcharge. And what I mean by that is here we've got a chart of, of LME nickel LME nickel for the last 12 months was, was looking the exact same way copper was, aluminum was, which was, it was just going straight up. You know, basically the same way every risk, risky market was, equities, doesn't matter. It was all just going straight up. About a month ago, we, we saw prices fall off a cliff. They went from about $9 a pound down to $7.50, which is roughly where we are today. So what happened? Well, about a month ago, there were real concerns. And then there have been real concerns. That as the United States and as the world pushes more and more towards a green energy future and pushes more towards electric vehicles, there was a real concern that finding uh, electric vehicle grade nickel was going to be an issue and that we could have eventual outages of refined nickel for electric vehicle production. Well, about a month ago, Singshan, which is the world's biggest stainless steel mill, they threw a wrench in that by uh, publicly coming out and saying, we successfully made electric vehicle grade nickel by utilizing nickel pig iron, which is a very abundant and cheap raw ingredient. It's a, it's a fairly highly energy intensive process, but they were able to convert that nickel pig iron into nickel mat, which is ultimately able to be turned into usable electric vehicle nickel. So what does that do? All of a sudden that threw all those fears about running out of refined nickel for the EV market to the wind and the price plummeted. Um, you know, where do we go from here now that we're at seven seven dollars and fifty cents? That that's a million dollar question. You know, we had a call earlier this week with the CRU. They tend to believe that the market is very well supplied. There's no real reason why we should expect you know shortages or any real spikes in in uh, in price from a, from a fundamental standpoint. But that being said, you know there is something to be said for the fact that a lot of money's been printed. The U.S. dollar has weakened over the last year. And a lot of this capital that's been printed is looking for a home. So there is some speculative money still involved in nickel. And, and there's still a lot of excitement around the electric vehicle space. So I, I think nickel's still getting a little bit of a money manager stability, if you will, that may be, may be potentially irrespective of the true fundamentals of supply demand conditions. But nonetheless, we saw a bit of a price correction. So that's ultimately going to feed through to slightly lower uh, stainless steel surcharges. Counteracting that, at least in the very short term, is chrome prices. This is a chart showing the South African chrome price. You can see that basically since January, we've seen a fairly sizable spike in chrome prices. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of that centered around the same excitement that was driving a lot of other risk assets. I, I think stainless steel demand is, is quite strong. Chrome got a beneficiary of that. Unfortunately, as soon as the Chrome index reset for Q2, which it did right around that time where this index hit 200, um, since that point, the market has, has actually softened a little bit. And I think for two reasons. One is, I think the upside move within Chrome probably overshot a little bit. I think the other aspect is we're hearing that China is actually starting to ramp up its production of ferrochrome, which is helping to soften that market. So. If I put on my forecasting hat again, Nick Webb's forecasting hat, not Ryerson's forecasting hat, um, it looks like all things being equal, Q2 is going to be the near-term peak. And as long as this chart holds true, 
it's, it seems likely that Q3 is actually gonna see a slight softening in the price of Chrome. Again, what that means is we could very well see Q3 surcharges actually move down. But again, I don't wanna, I don't wanna miss the point that even though that may still happen, stainless steel markets look extremely tight and, uh, and we could actually see a divergence with commodities coming down, but yet stainless steel markets remain extremely tight. So again, it, it's, a, it's, it's one of the most interesting, peculiar markets that I've seen. I think many of my peers would agree, and some of these peers have been in the industry for 30, 40 years. Um, so we got to stay close to all this. But um, at that point, at this point in time, that's, that's kind of what we know. That's what we're watching. Uh, I want to take a quick moment to thank everybody on the call for, for joining us. Hopefully you find this information useful now and, and as we roll these out in the months in the, ahead. But uh, really appreciate everybody's time. And Michael, I'll kick it over to you at this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nick, you know, a lot going on. And I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and I'm glad we got into uh, to, to the details about, you know, when we talk about the prices are going, going higher, there's a lot of things that factor into that equation, whether you're talking carbon, aluminum, stainless. So I think this is really good information. Um, I'd remind the, the audience, we, we still have a few minutes if you'd like to get in a question or two. Um, I do have a few in the queue here, Nick, but I'd like to, to tee up to you from, from one, of our, um, one of our listeners. Going back to the, the color chart, the, the PMI data, right? Um, that You're pulling that, so the ISM. The ISM has a certain number, but um, this for the U.S. is showing a different number. It, this is being pulled from from Bloomberg, right? So, is, is there yeah. differences in, in maybe explain the differences in the? Yeah, situation? sure. So, so there there are a couple different indices. The same way you would have CRU and AMM publish a steel number, it, it's similar in this regard. Where, you know, keep in mind these are surveys. So, the Institute of Supply Chain Management actually puts together its own survey. And that creates the ISM manufacturing data point. They also would, they also do a services data point as well, um, but that's just one entity that's doing this survey, uh, both for North America as well as globally. This particular data, just because I use a different set of data within this table, I'm maybe giving more detail than what you need. But the reason why I use this particular set of data, it's called Market, is is the data provider. Um, the reason why I use it is because they ha they have a better uh, ability to give regional data from, from a global standpoint. So I like to not just look at US data, but also look at the macro data on, on a global scene. Because like I said, China matters, the Eurozone matters massively to, to metals prices. Um, so their data just tends to be a little more global in scope. So yeah, you will notice slight dif differentiations between the market survey and what it spits out and the ISM survey and what it spits out. But generally speaking, they're surveying the same types of people Unless, unless something peculiar is going on or people are fudging their, their responses to these surveys, they should generally track and correlate very well. They're not going to be wildly different, correct? Yeah. No, another question here from, from the audience. Um, we mentioned the chip shortage, and I think that that's really impacting the marketplace, right? Because those go, go in everything from my car to, you know, maybe a, a refrigerator here and there. But, you know, do we think the chip shortage at automotive was going to eventually slow steel shipments at all have a big impact there? It is a phenomenal question. And as a, uh, as a Ford shareholder and hopeful eventual sh uh, Ford vehicle owner, because I haven't had a car for the last five years, I think, um, I'm hoping to get a car again here soon. And I'm being told that I, I it's, it's being delayed. So um, do I think it's gonna have an impact on steel shipments? Well. I'm going to give a little bit of a political answer, but I'll, I'll give the most honest answer I can give, which on one hand, I would think that at some point it absolutely should. If, 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 if the big three of Ford, GM and, and Chrysler and, and Tesla arguably aren't able to obtain semiconductors, then they can't complete a car. At some point, I would grow concerned that at some point those inventories of vehicles may grow so large that they eventually say, we don't need steel anymore because we don't have any places to put these unfinished cars. But I will counter that by saying, from what we're hearing, a lot of the, a lot of what the manufacturers are doing in the meantime, assuming that this is only a finite situation, you know, it might be a couple of weeks, it might be a month, but as long as it, as long as this semiconductor shortage is a finite situation, I think the OEMs are taking the approach that they can proceed with actually doing, you know, the body of the car, putting the seats in it, 
doing everything else except for the components that they have shortages of. And, and, and admittedly, it's not just semiconductors. There are plastic parts. I'm sure they're having issues with aluminum supplies. Um, and, but what, I'm, what we're hearing is that they're actually producing all the other elements of the vehicle. And then at the very last second, as soon as they get that semiconductor, they're plugging it in and shipping it out. So there's a chance that it has less of an impact on steel shipments because they're just, they're continuing to buy steel. They're continuing to, to put it into the cars and implement it. My concern would be if the semiconductor shortage lasts longer than the two weeks or the four weeks that they've historically said that it, it could or would. Um, if it starts going beyond that, and like I said, you start developing parking lots and parking lots of unfinished vehicles, I would believe at some point the automotive industry would say, we don't need this steel anymore because we've got too big of a lot of inventory. It's definitely a concern because I mean, the auto automotive industry buys huge quantities of carbon steel and, and huge quantities of, of aluminum coil. Um, and, and that would be that would be something that would cause some issues at the mill level, for sure. Yeah, and I've seen reports of even like different industries that have kind of maybe reallocating their, their chips to automotive and yeah. that could have a residual effect. Um, a few questions here, um, just in general, asking about um, the presentation, Nick, um, doing a fabulous job as always. Um, so um, we're going to have this recording available on Ryerson.com next week. Um, but I, I think, you know, I, I guess one last thing I, I just can, can maybe leave the audience with maybe one key takeaway um, from this. I know that's a lot kind of, you just, you gave us a lot, but I, I guess maybe a, a, a parting thought for, for well, what we the, fir the first takeaway is that pour over coffee is the best kind of coffee. Highly it is. It is. Um, <laughs> second takeaway is, man, it, more, more so than ever, stay close to your Ryerson counterparts. And, and because we're, we're providing this information out to them as, as frequently as we can be. And, and for a lot of us who have been in this industry, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, this is new terrain for us. Um, we're all kind of navigating it together. And I, and I promise you, we're all, we're all working as hard as we can to make this as right as we can, but we are all in this together. So be patient with us, we'll be patient with you. And, uh, but, but the, these supply shortages, at least in my opinion, hopefully are temporary. Um, you know, my personal, my personal take, and, and Jay Powell actually said this a little bit ago. I, there are some things I disagree with him on, there are some things I agree with him on. I believe that, that we're finding out right now how delicate our supply chains are on a global basis. And we're, we're unfortunately just living it live right now where it's almost like the butterfly effect where who could have guessed that a ship in the Suez Canal could cause you know, a ripple effect to, through to the right. price of steel in the United States. It, these are things we would have, I mean, we, we know that there's interconnectivity between supply chains, but it seems like the smallest fractions of inefficiencies, whether it's you know, ports having to take additional health measures to get employees feeling safe, to get them back to work, or whatever the, whatever the mechanism is, all of these tiny little inefficiencies are causing huge buildups in supply chain bottlenecks. And we're all living them. Uh, I, I, I hope, I believe truly that with vaccines, with return back to some semblance of normalcy comes more efficiency. And I believe that at some point, all of these supply chains can, can come back and hopefully we learn from our, our mistakes and our sensitivities to these supply chains um, and that we improve them. But, uh, but again, my key takeaway is be patient with our, with our Ryerson sales teams and our product managers, uh, because we're going through the same stuff you guys are, and we're working through this as hard as we can, but uh, we'll get through this. Agree, and I, I'd, I'd echo that. Um, that's that's kind of what we're hoping to accomplish here with Cup of Joe, having this conversation because we're just it, these are the these are this is what's going on in the marketplace, and just digging into details and you know, hopefully um, educating you know, market at, at whole on this. So, Nick, I thank you for your time. Everyone, thank you for attending, and um, cheers. Cheers, Mike, and everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>